This has been passed because I've been asked to um, be uh, passed. Um, and most of what I'm going to say is pretty obvious, and some of it's redundant, but it still needs to be said. So, uh, people have a lot of different worries and different concerns and, and lots of hopes and lots of dreams, but people also don't really have a lot of time. And, you know, burdened with the kind of everyday uh, realities, there's not often a lot of leeway in people's schedules to you know, uh, get involved with politics. You know, the, the triumph of the mundane has kind of uh, left the spectacular behind and we need to take it in in small doses. And, you know, most people are active in very few, if any, issues. So, uh, the articulation of any issue uh, is kind of subject to a political reality and to an individual capacity. So a person might be a peace activist or an animal welfare activist or a consumer rights activist or something like that. They might campaign against fracking or, or you know, better treatment of immigrants or of prisoners or, you know, or the elderly or whatever. And some raise money for the causes and raise awareness about diseases and, and that kind of thing. Uh, but comparatively few expand their scope to actually include the mundane or to encompass all of the spectacular kind of things that we we want to talk about. Um, and occasionally, uh, an issue is articulated through the creation of a political party. And this is done with the best of intentions uh, and with a series of assumptions. So one of the assumptions is that, um, that whereas political power lies with the legislature or, go uh, legislature or the government, then participation in the legislature or the government is the mechanism by which power can be channeled uh, to the issue in question. Right? Uh, the second assumption is that, um, uh, that power cannot be channeled adequately or efficiently without participating, uh, participating in the legislature or the government. And third, there's the assumption that the issue is sufficiently popular that representatives of the cause can win out over other candidates in a fair election. And then the fourth, uh, I think, is that uh, given a space within the legislature or the government and thus a fragment of that power, the legislature or the government will treat the cause with due reverence. Now, in practice, few or none of these assumptions hold true. Um, and despite this, single issue parties are quite common. You know, many of them are, are very short-lived. You've got some examples, uh, you know, uh, some, of the, some of these are defunct, others are still existing, but you know, in the US, you've got the Free Soilers, the Grangers, the Bull Moose Party, you know, various. Uh, in the UK, you've got the Animal Welfare Party, the National Health Action Party, uh, the Legal Legalized Cannabis Alliance. In Canada, you've got the Animal Alliance Environment Voters Party. And, you know, you, you kind of go down the line, and pretty much every country, you get single issue parties popping up. And, you know, some parties manage to. Um, uh, to expand their scope to the point where, where they're viable for, as general purpose parties. So the Whig Party in the UK back in, in the 1700s was originally founded around, um, uh, around the question of uh, central banking and, and uh, essentially land ownership in, in a weird roundabout way. But then it got expanded and, and became the modern Labour Party over a long time. And similarly, the Bloc Québécois and the Green Party is all over the place. You know, they were constructed around environmentalism, but are now general purpose movements. So it's worth trying to make some distinctions. Um, so I'm trying to use the term single issue party to refer to a political party that exists to push a single issue, not a single ideology, kind of broadly, uh, or the general concerns of a particular group people, but rather uh, a particular concern that, that might appeal to anybody. Uh, and so I include Bloc Québécois as a single issue party historically, uh, because their mainstay was the independence of Quebec, uh, with all this being secondary. You know. But I generally not include nationalist parties as single issue parties, uh, or you know, unless they were nationalist with a particular specific issue on their agenda. So, you know, like, um, that their only issue was to get rid of everybody uh, out of the country who wasn't part of the nation or something like that. Um, and one might argue that the British Nationalist Party is a single issue party you know, because of that. So it's probably also worth saying that a single issue party can 
uh, have more than one issue, and that might be a bit confusing, but uh, early Green parties were environmental parties, but they, they had a broad single focus. You know, the environment's pretty big. So they concerned themselves with all sorts of niches, uh, and issues such as you know, natural resource extraction, animal welfare, overfishing, soil erosion, uh, climate change, you know, whatever. Uh, similarly, pirate parties were founded largely around copyright reform and privacy issues. Um, and from there on, they've in some places expanded to cover the, the rights of people online in general, uh, but would still effectively count as single issue parties in most countries. Not all countries, some of them have expanded. And all of this is, of course, really fuzzy, right? Um, you know, we, uh, but if we can roughly agree that single issue parties are, are as I defined them, then, then we're good. So, so there's a lot of good arguments for establishing single issue uh, political movements, uh, you know, uh, of any kind, right? Uh, lobby movements that uh, you know they can wield a lot of power, they can do a lot of things. Civil society can that change, but when a group engages in kind of a, the party political system, it's necessary to have at least some idea of what's going on beyond a single issue or or category. You know, so a person who's elected to a parliament is is not really there to work on one single issue. Parliaments are never that granular. You know. Um, the regular parliamentarian is going to be expected to deliberate on and vote on issues as far apart as agriculture and import tariffs and immigration and taxation and public finances and, and you know, human rights and banking regulation, social housing, you know, it, it goes on and on and on. You, you've got a lot of things to deal with and you are one of the votes if you're in a parliament. Um, and the person elected into a parliament on the platform of, say, you know, saving the whales, right? That person has a split mandate because by constitutional decree, they're required to and able to have a say on every single issue that comes through the parliament. They, they have their minutes, they, they can speak up, uh, and they can ultimately vote. But you know, by virtue of their campaign, they have made no promises or guarantees to the electorate about how they will behave in that kind of situation. And that means that they are effectively wild cards in the political system. They, they do practically whatever they want, following whichever interests and influences they have. Sometimes this is mediated through kind of the party mechanism, but if the party is a single issue party, boom, suddenly all of that goes away. So, you know, split mandates, we get whimsy, and whimsy does not a good policy make, right? You, you need something more, more structured. Aside from that, you know, you need to be on top of things in a broad sense, so it's the issue of, you know, the power dynamics. Um, if you have a parliament of 100 people and half of them are somehow one, in one way or another dedicated to you know, the very single issue, uh, some single issues, then the other 50 people in the parliament hold you know, on average twice as much power as they should according to the constitution. Right? Uh, and in reality it's not uncommon uh, for over specialization in parliamentary roles to uh, to cause a way more bloated power base than that. So, you know, party leaders tend to really, in a, or party whips, tend to wield practically the power of all of the uh, seats in their parliament uh, uh, belonging to the party. So, you know, um, yeah, deference to leadership basically is, is proof that that happens. So, <coughs> somebody said that uh, specialization is for insects. Um, I'm not sure, you know, how realistic that is uh, to, to assume that humans won't specialize, but, but in the post-industrial world, uh, it's becoming more and more common that specialization bleeds through everything. Uh, less and less common that people can be generalists. You know, there's simply just too many things in the world for everybody to, or for anybody to have a good concept or grasp of everything. Um, and, you know, the generalist, as a result, when they do show up, they, they aren't very widely suffered People don't really want them to be there. They don't accept them too much. They uh, they're just quirky and weird, and, and never manage to finish their university degrees, and never really get a stable job, and keep kind of bouncing around the entire system because everybody wants a specialist, and nobody knows what to do with the generalist. But at the same time, I think you know we need generalists politically, and you know that's a kind of weird crisis that we're having. 
but there is another app. So um, you know, if people, or at least not all people, can be journalists, then then at least the party can be, and it must be if it's going to succeed. You know, the the lesson we can take from the green movement uh, that they learned the hard way um, is, you know, basically. What the Green Movement did was they took environmentalism and generalized it. They made it into a, a holistic thing. So they brought, adopted a broad range of policies covering virtually every uh, subject area. It's kind of interesting actually how, uh, how very few Green parties in the world actually have uh, defense policies. Uh, you know, it's, it's a topic that every country in the world somehow has to deal with, and Green parties just kind of sideline around it and, and uh, yell peace whenever somebody brings it up. Uh, that's a very laudable political stance, but actually it's not very practical if, if you know, um, a large part of the public budget is going into financing a military. So, but instead of going you know, the obvious route of adopting uh, policies kind of flat out from similar movements, so like the Social Democrats in the case of the Greens, um, you know, that would have been a really easy thing to do. You know, they pick up the social democratic approach to healthcare, or education, or industry, and and then just tack on their environmentalism as a as a you know as a kind of basis, but but off to the side. But the green movements didn't do that. Instead, they took their underlying principles of environmentalism and constructed you know their entire policy school you know off the back of, of the environmentalism idea. And of course, the result was quite similar to social democracy, you know. But the method of getting there really matters. So pirate parties, I think, can do the same. You know, if you look at our core tenets, the, there's a lot of common themes. You know, civil liberties in particular, uh, freedom of expression, but not to the exclusion of privacy and its alter ego transparency. You know, um, and we tend to talk about things like copyright, and and we could generalize that over to monopoly rights. You know. More, more broadly, uh, and we should talk a lot more about monopoly rights. I, I think you know this focus on certain types of monopolies is not good, and we should focus on on more. Uh, we also talk about ICTs and, and you know uh, telecommunications more generally, and uh, and underpinning all of the stuff we we tend to go on and on about is kind of this weird wild notion of democracy. Uh, so specifically, increasing the capacity of of common people to have direct control over their affairs, right? So, you know, frankly, and you know, uh, without uh, without meaning to to uh, make fun or light of all of the good work we've been doing in topics like copyright, you know, copyright is fucking boring. Sorry, it just it you know, it's just not a a, a core thing for all of humanity. It's not something that humanity typically cares about. It is important that we reform it, but I can't find any way to be shocked when you know poor election results uh, come in for a party that, that goes on and on about copyright and never talks about real issues that most people have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, the real issues that people are suffering from. So copyright is a problem. Yes, it's a big problem, but it's also a luxury problem. And you know, let's fix it, but let's also fix everything else. So you know, let's do a quick exercise here. You know, let's construct some policies, right? Agriculture. You know, how how does greater communications capacity help people to grow more and better crops? You know, can computation help farmers? Uh, how do land monopolies reduce the capacity of new farmers to enter the market? Uh, are factory farm, farms you know actually? More effective than organic farming because you know there's a bunch of research uh, from Agatha Perfecto and various others that suggests that organic farming can be at least well up to four times more efficient and effective than than factory farming or or uh, inorganic uh, as they call it although there's still carbon atoms involved um, uh, you know but how can a scientific view on on agriculture help you know and how can we adopt such a view Without falling into the pitfalls of the kind of high modernist agricultural schemes like you know the groundnut madness in Tanzania, uh, which you know all of these schemes have invariably failed, and in the best cases of failures have given us uh, worse crops manufactured by bigger companies, uh, you know, and 
and a, a, a food chain that is in, unviable long term. You know, transparency in agriculture might give us more understanding of, of what works and what not. So let's take industry. Uh, so from a civil libertarian perspective, how can it be acceptable for humans to have to compete on a not really free market against infatigable machines that, you know, machines that can go on day, on, day in and day out without ever getting tired, and, you know, humans are actually being made to compete against these. Not just in, in big industry, but also if you ever go to a grocery store in, in say, the UK now, or at an airport, there are these machines that have replaced the, the, the cashiers. You know, every part of the thing is being uh, uh, automated and just, you know, yeah, automated. And that's okay. Automation is good. But we do need to think about what the role of the human is in, in that thing. And then on top of that, you know, how come large scale companies and large scale industries always trump everything? You know, even though you've got like 97% of all companies are SMEs, typically in Europe, then they generate about 70 to 80% of the uh, gross national income for most countries. You know, but the traditional politics, they pay, pay lip service to SMEs, but you know, because everybody knows really that small is better and small is more effective. But in practice, they focus only on the large companies because the large companies are more legible. It's more easy to understand what those companies are doing. And they're easier to interact with because there are fewer lobbyists. You know, they, they are a much more uh, kind of easy and predictable source of campaign contributions and, and you know, coherent lobbying efforts. And on top of that, their growth shows up slightly faster in national statistics. You know, the big companies are what get all of the attention despite the fact that they don't really matter as, a, you know, that much of a percentage of the global, global economy. And yet we, you know, all do this. Then, you know, state finances, right? You know, greater transparency in public finances, uh, greater public capacity to, to determine public finances. You know, both of these could reduce cost and, and increase efficiency. Um, but the uh, kind of you know the current situation in public finances is really only a few steps away from from a medieval mindset. You know taxes are collected coercively and used to pay for projects determined by the elite. A public input is of little import. It doesn't really matter. Nobody cares. And if this changes, you know greater levels of, of conviviality can be achieved. We we can spend less of our collective societal resources you know, on vanity projects and short-sighted utopianism. That sounds like a good idea, right? Education, everybody's favorite, you know, everybody has an opinion. Um, you know, but the origins of the current educational system, basically uh, they expose the objective of education to mass manufacture human drones with standardized skills for the exploitation on the labor market, right? And I'm just going to allow myself to uh, quote Ivan Illich uh, here because he said what needs to be said about education better than I ever could and manages to, to expand it over a lot of topics. He said, many students, especially those who are poor, intuitively know what schools do for them. They school them to confuse process and substance. Once these become blurred, a new logic is assumed. The more treatment there is, the better the results, or escalation leads to success. The pupil is there by school to confuse teaching with learning, great advancement with education, a diploma with competence, and fluency with the ability to say something new. His imagination is schooled to accept service in place of value. Medical treatment is mistaken for health care, social work for the improvement of community life, police protection for safety, military poise for national security, the rat race for productive work. Health, learning, dignity, independence, and the creative endeavor are defined as little more than the performance of the institutions which claim to serve these ends, and their improvement is made to depend on allocating more resources to the management of hospitals, schools, and other agencies in question. Right? This, is, this is a profound thought that, that even Illich had, and it basically, you know, it's from his book, Deschooling Society, which if you haven't read, please go and read it, you know, at some point. Uh, because you know we really need to de-school society from this stuff. But you know, generally speaking, I think what we can do is we can apply the thematic underpinnings of pirate philosophy to every subject matter, and and we really should. We have to, and this will give us good results. I'm I'm sure of it. 
you know, we, we've done some experimentation in the Icelandic Pirates to kind of uh, figure out our way on with this. And we've gotten a lot of good ideas. It's not perfect yet. I mean, the Icelandic Pirates, the economic policy is kind of shit. You know, but there's room for improvement. We can, we can do some good stuff. But this direction generally, I think, is really useful because taking the pirate mindset, which is all about openness and collaboration and, and you know, collective action, and, uh, and being able to, to kind of work together in more efficient ways and having you know, pri privacy and transparency and, and a you know, active functioning democracy at the core of it, that's a really good starting point on which to build a society. But, so historically, there is this tendency to shove political debates of each time into a narrow dichotomy. Right? Uh, it's shaped by some overriding argument. So before the Industrial Revolution, the dichotomy was about the extent of monarchic control. It was the royalists versus the, the republicans, um, you know, or feudalism and parliamentarism, or however you want to put it. And that debate went on for a while, and, and the republicans kind of mostly won. And then we just moved on, and there are still some kings uh, and such scattered around Europe, but. Uh, but largely they have become inconsequential, except in value. Uh, but then the Industrial Revolution came along and brought new arguments, you know, which have been basically framed into this dichotomy as an argument between individualism and socialism. And you know, again, that debate isn't over. Neither of these debates are over, but they've pretty much been proven both to be false dichotomies. Right? The, there is a lot more nuance. So we're in this kind of weird hyper-connected communication age or in, in, you know, internet age or digital age or whatever people want to call it. And this is forcing us into this weird third dichotomy. It is equally false, but we're going to have to play at it for a while. Right? That's just the way it's going to be. And every dichotomy has its political movements. You know, Tories versus Whigs or communists versus capitalists or whatever. Um, and, you know, Although the Greens did well, they, they did, I think, ultimately fail, but they did do quite well in kind of delineating a, a way by which you take a, a, a set of ideas and expand them over everything. But they were an offshoot of kind of the socialist uh, arm of the last great dichotomy. And I believe that the pirates could, you know, if we managed to expand our scope a little bit, become the first party of the third dichotomy. You know, the argument of this age is that of centralization versus decentralization. We, we are basically the first decentralizationist movement. And all of traditional politics is the politics of centralization. So you know, if we finish this task of running through the subject matters and rejecting all of the kind of single issue politics that are kind of getting through everything, then we can actually change the world. But if we just keep circle jerking each other about you know copyright and net neutrality and, and stuff like that which is really important but kind of inconsequential to 90% of humanity or 95% or maybe even 99% you know then no matter how important those issues are we will never be more than a short and fairly unremarkable footnote in the history books I'd rather us not be there thanks Thank you very much, Sumeri, for your uh, presentation. Now, uh, due to our time is limited, we only get two questions. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. Very uh, important thoughts that I mostly agree with. I'm, I'm wondering, though, uh, for a party that comes from the internet, what does decentralization actually mean? Because on the one hand, of course, uh, the internet is kind of built uh, in a decentralized way, but at the same time, it's a global network. And like, uh, how do you see the pirates um, in relation to globalization? Yeah. Well, so the fact that we came from the internet means that we know a lot about decentralization. We we know it because the internet is, as you say, decentralized. Yet over the last. Uh, 15 years roughly uh, since the, uh, the, the kind of uh, re-merging of the baby bells and, and uh, the um, privatization of the national telcos throughout Europe, 
you've seen this kind of uh, uh, kind of conversion of uh, internet service providers, for instance, into relatively few nodes. Uh, many countries in Europe only have maybe two or three internet service providers that actually work uh, everywhere. And this is a far cry from you know 1994, five, six, when there was an internet service provider in every little town, you know, wherever in, in Europe, and that was great. Um, but the the more important thing is we can take this lesson of decentralization that we we take from the internet because we know that hyperlinking is good. We know that that you know uh, not having a single point of failure is good, and we can apply it to everything else. You know, um, why is there a, a centralized, uh, you know, why is there a, a single central bank for each country? Why is there a single centralized curriculum for education? Why do, you know, uh, basically every part of our, our societies is in one way or another centralized. Of course, they're centralized to varying degrees. Some countries are, are more kind of like Ireland, uh, spreading out their institutions around the, the country and such. But, you know, by and large, it has been uh, a very centralized thing, and and I think that our our idea is to a large degree taking everything and splitting it out and allowing more people to have more access to the decision making processes. And, you know, that's that's I think what what matters here. Is that good enough? <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, as far as I see, you are not a pessimist. Uh, I guess you, you, are, you are not a pessimist. I, pessimist? Yes. Ah. Okay, I thought you said pacifist. And, uh, no, no, no. I, I, I not use violence. But. You're, you're, not one, you're not one. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess you don't believe in class politics. Uh, but there are still some stratas in the society. Yeah. Uh, with which people you think to do those things together? Mm. Who are uh, those people that have uneasiness with the system? What do you think? And uh, a little uh, criticism. Uh, politicization of the culture is a good thing, but uh, culturalization of politics is not. I believe, and it, uh, there is an there is a very deep gap between them. Culturalization of politics would uh, make political action uh, to uh, to a cultural activity. So it means to absor absorb the oppositional energy of some people. What do you think about this topic? Okay, so yeah, um, so yes, I do believe in class politics and class struggle. Uh, I, I actually think it's very important. Uh, on the other hand, I think that um, one of the big mistakes that Marx made was to uh, try to uh, pit the the uh, proletariat against the petit bourgeois, uh, because you know the the bourgeois is a larger group as uh, you know as the ownership class. Um, Yes, certainly there is that kind of one percent at the top that's uh, um, that's driving all of the centralization and all of the monopolization in society. But there is that interesting uh, seven percent uh, of, of society that Ben Katesho called the the Jeffersonian middle class. Uh, that is, you know, they are uh, not massive owners of big things. They are, you know, the guy that runs a convenience store in the corner, the guy that you know runs a little uh, web design startup. You know, the, you know, all of those people, the the people who aren't exactly in abject poverty, but you know, they're doing reasonably well for themselves. But they are, um, they are people who own stuff, and uh, and instantly they have a very large role in society, and uh, this is a point that's argued quite well in, uh, in a, a book by James C. Scott called uh, Two Cheers for Anarchism. Um, but, you know, I, I think what we need to do is focus on basically, you know, uh, uh, to take a, a horrifying, uh, you know, uh, occupy kind of uh, term, focus on the 99%, focus on politicizing everybody who is on the lower end of the spectrum 
whether that's the petite bourgeois or the, uh, the proletariat, and realize that those people are a kind of new class in a networked environment that in a, another setting I called uh, the protocolitariat, the people who, who every day live their lives by their ability to communicate with each other. And you know, uh, focusing on those people, focusing on their ability to communicate, that's a really good starting point. You know, uh, of course, what that means in practice, we'll have to see. Uh, How about the food connection and cultural group, culturalization of food? Yeah, so the, I don't think culturalization of politics is a bad idea. Um, uh, it's uh, definitely a, a new thing, but uh, in in kind of the mindset. But if you have ever you know gone to a cafe or gone visited your aunt or whatever, and you sit down and you're drinking coffee, politics will very frequently come up. That is a part of our culture, and you know the only thing that that I'm suggesting we change is to make uh, you know a, a movement from. Uh, political discussion and uh, what somebody called uh, coffee shop communism uh, to to the kind of more focused thing of actually getting something done. You know, uh, giving people the tools and the capacity to move from whining about their problems, you know, of which there are many, to actually fixing their problems so that there are fewer. And you know, uh, if that turns out to be a bad thing. Fine, I will. I will happily accept that blame. I had one more sentence. Uh, for instance, in the Occupy movement, Zizek warned those people: please don't make it as a cultural activity and uh, don't let it become a good memory of uh, your youth. <laughs> I think, for once, I agree with Zizek. That's maybe the first time ever. Uh, but no, uh, I mean, part of it is that it, it, Occupy was uh, in many ways a great movement, but it was uh, unsustainable both long term and short term. And, um, you know, the, the, the problem is that most people go through lives with memories of their youth. So for some, it's Occupy, for others, it's, uh, you know, the student riots of 67, 69, whatever. You know. I need to add. Because the uh, are occupy a protest against car protest. Yeah. Uh, uh, that was unbelievable. Yes. Really, it was un un unbelievable. And uh, at the opposition uh, part of the protest, uh, there was only a man rejected by car door, and uh, he was the. We don't know how to present elections. Yeah. <laughs> but, and but because yeah. of it, there, there is no way. Let's take this offline. Let's okay. talk about it afterwards. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you all. Uh, our next speaker is Oana. Uh, I kindly invite to Oana for her speech. system. I'm talking more about the, the, the cultural and behavior content of democracy and the way that uh, people enable it when they act in their uh, everyday lives. I'm, I'm not a pessimist. Actually, I'm Wrong or even evil. It's associated with 
with terrorists, it's associated with violence, it's associated with highlight illegal play issues, and maybe the most uh, mild concern, but by the same time the most bitter, is that decentralized communities are considered to be worthless, inefficient, and with no impact at all. But most of these decentralized networks are based on some kind of sharing, sharing knowledge, sharing information, share, sharing goods, and so on. And that means they help at their base, at their near base, an altruistic behavior. And that altruistic behavior it works more like a more like a vector because it determines determines certain patterns of uh, activity. I'm going to talk about uh, I don't know if it's very uh, famous the uh, issue I'm going to address, but I'm going to talk about the centrality of exotic reasoning inside decentralized organizations. Because most of us, we are accustomed to think that altruist behavior is either egotistic, either communitarian. If it's egotistic, well then we do good because we want to feel good, we want to diminish our uh, distress, and this is not gonna get us too far because we are not actually improving our community or our social uh, social culture. If we are communitarian, well, then we are doing something good because we uh, want, because we feel empathy with the others, we recognize ourselves and the profile of uh, the one we help. And this is also about getting us uh, too far because we're not gonna help people who are not sharing our main concerns. But the quixotic mentality, the quixotic reasoning, it means something else. It means that if I'm going to help someone, if I'm going to share something with someone, I'm not doing that because I recognize myself in his profile or because I feel good by doing that. I'm doing it because I just think and I just feel that in such a manner, I would participate to a better world. It's very utopic and most of the people still don't believe this is a real motive. But psychologists actually validated it. So we're going to talk about shared economy-based system that seems to be conducive actually to quixotic reasoning and it's a very new phase in, our, in social development. And this is important because new new social movements, those connective social movements, are prone to enhance the, pro the preference for self-transcendent knowledge. It's, an it's another notion that most of us are skeptical of because self-transcendent knowledge means that we are uh, not thinking in terms of uh, how I could benefit from an event or how I could benefit from an acti activity, but I'm acting on it because I'm in the mood of a flow. I mean the flow, I'm passionate about it, and my actions are not, uh, are, are not measured, are not balanced, are not the result of a calculus, are a result of expressing myself, and this, is, and this changes everything. So the centrality of exotic re reasoning, I mean the members of new, new social movements, require new frames for predicting, predicting the span of action among them because they have very, very different w ways to act. And I'm going to insist on this later. For now, I'm, got, I'm just going to say that when quixotic reasoning appears, well, then for, let's take a protest, for example. A protest that is based on quixotic ideology, on the top something that uh, looks like very idealist and uh, it's uh, considered to be a topic. Well, they don't just act and they, they vanish. They are highly unpredictable and they generally, uh, generally their movements are uh, spread on a very, very, very wide uh, time frame. 
it's not like if this year I have a protest, then this is the end of it because the protest was born. The next year probably I have another one and, and uh, there could be two years of silence and there again a, a new spring of protest would come because this is how quixotic reasoning action when it's uh, part of, peop of people mind frames enables them to act each time they feel like it and they don't, they don't, even they are not programmatic, they are on the long, on the long run much more efficient because they don't, they don't just uh, get down when they lose control. They don't, uh, they, if they fail, they don't stay failed. But the experience of flow is very important for this kind uh, of actions. First, there are two questions. We should, we should talk about, we should put ourselves in order to understand why we are so skeptical about uh, issues like quixotic reasoning, self-transcendent uh, uh, knowledge, self-transcendent mentality, and decentralized uh, communities. First is why we don't trust good doers, because we don't trust good doers. And second is why does decentralization scares us? Well, why don't we trust people who pretend to do good or to think just uh, at the, a higher level? Because we are not accustomed to it. Hobbes made a very good case and those in the power and his apologetics, pundits, politicians and all those just embraced the, his ideas because the nature human, because the human nature is considered to be evil, prone to violence, to conflict, then we have to pay attention. We need the institution to protect us from ourselves and from our, from our peers. So, that's, that's how decentralization <laughs> actually got its long shot. Because when I need to be protected by my uh, from my fellows, then I need someone who could manage this protection system. I'm not allowed to express myself on my true nature because my true nature is an evil one. It's a one that condu it's conducive to conflict. And if I'm not able to express my uh, true nature, that means that I should be actually handicapped or, sl or slowed down anyway. But in the, by the same time, there are not only those who believe in uh, centralization. There are, there are several, many, many movements considered to be anarchist and the modern uh, anarchist, uh, especially, uh, they hold different, uh, different uh, worldviews about, about the human nature. They, for, if you would read some of their diaries, you would uh, often find that they say that people would be really, really good if they were allowed to use their conscience, to express their conscience, to express their true nature, it's not because their nature they are doing bad and bad deeds, it's because they are not allowed to exercise their individual conscience. Well, so, uh, the transcendentalist movement of Emerson and Thoreau in the United States made a plea for, for decentralization, for letting people just express themselves and collaborate and to live, not uh, to live outside the system. They, and they understood that rebellion, rebellion doesn't mean violence, but actually means authenticity. But, of course, they didn't uh, win the case. They were considered utopic, they were considered uh, dreamers, unrealistic, and so from the, uh, the current, in this uh, competition, the, tame, the human as a tame beast was the winner, and not the entrapped spirit as 
Los Angeles fault. So we in that that's the short presentation of how we got to stick with a certain uh, set of values. Hierarchical order of control, external constraints to balance our internal lack of balance. These are values that are very very much internalized by most of us. So decentralization scares us the most because it uh, put focus on individuals, on their freedom. Freedom of individual and power of the individual is actually what is at the root of our skeptic skeptical attitude toward decentralization. There are actually, if you look at uh, the evolution of uh, mentalities and uh, theories about social uh, uh, social organization and political social organization, you could uh, you could uh, observe a specific pattern. At first, in twenties, for example, individuals were not even perceived as something important or something to work for. They were part of the silent flock with no individual no individuality, no conscience, no autonomy. So practically, the individual didn't exist in their uh, in their mind frame. But th but then the concept got uh, extended on the background of uh, social movements for civ uh, civil rights. Individual a plethora of scholars just uh, started to make lobby for uh, so social groups, for so social uh, change. And actually it was kind of simple because uh, institution said, you are irrational, we are rational, so that's uh, why we have the right to rule you. And then organized group for social change just say, well, we are rational too, so we should have the same power and the same recognition as you are. And it was the first, uh, the first conceptual extension that actually brought uh, the individual into attention. But it wasn't that, that wasn't uh, the moment. Because if uh, just the groups were attributed with uh, rationality, not the individual itself. However, a qualitative leap took place, and that's when we started to value subjectivity. Value subjectivity actually changed a lot because the social change wasn't perceived anymore as a calculus, as a rational calculus, but it was uh, a calculus based on shifts with, within our worldviews, within our schemata, within our uh, way to perceive the world, to perceive the life, and to uh, get accustomed with it. So once that we actually became conscious about uh, the power of subjectivism, we made an, another, uh, another step in recognizing the potential power that an individual could have, because he still is a follower. He still doesn't have uh, uh, very much importance in changing things, but now he's uh, he's significant in uh, sh by sharing his uh, worldviews. He's significant uh, for uh, make others and uh, change that worldview. So he has a passive a passive uh, power to change. And then it was another second conceptualist uh, extension, of course because he, he, he was now considered to, to be significant by his personal experience. And if uh, you remember, on, in the 20s, that individual was considered irrational. Now, irrational, irrationality is understood within the frame of subjectivism. So he has conscience, he was attributed with conscience. Uh, and last, the paradigm shift is required. Because now, when the individual has conscience, has rationality, and he is, passed, uh, he is participating to, his, uh, to the world, even though on a passive, uh, passive uh, base, 
now is the time when he have he has to gain his recognition for his power to act actively participating to the war. At first, it was just equalizing uh, the, the the team of individuals lobbyists and the team of uh, institutional lobbyists because now individual is considered to be able to have a, a, a relation of collaboration based uh, on reci uh, reciprocal determination and reciprocal control with institutions. If someone is able to control or to take accountable an institution, then it, on a symbolic order, of course, it has the same level power as that uh, of that actor. So the slogan now is like what can be done by those who are up, it can be done by those who are at the bottom. And this, this was really important for the last step in our um, acceptance of the value of the common man. Now we are almost able to recognize that just one person could have a wide, uh, widespread effect because of uh, his network life. So the model of the extreme democracy actually is holding exactly that, that you, should, you could have no leaders and still be significant. And this was the paradigm shift and the new worldview and on this actually are based all the decentralized uh, organization. On this conception that one individual can have power and is significant and is a brand new concept. We are not accustomed to think like that. We are actually accustomed to think that individual have no individual has no power if it is not integrated into some sort of system. So as long as the, our good world is perceived in a way that, uh, that values organization and hierarchical order, we are not, of course, prone to give any credits to individuals, generally. And most of us, we are accustomed with this worldview because, of course, internet, the appearance of the internet made us familiar with more familiar with the decentralized way of being in the world, but the internet is brand new in, his, in history. So, the decentralization, as I said, was mainly associated with conflict and with, even with terrorism, and that's in part explainable because of our worldviews that values order, but what what's actually in a decentralized uh, organization after all. I use, I'm gonna present the ideal type. The ideal type is not, it's just a model. But, but models could be, just, uh, could be very important to make some distinction that, so our analysis would not be vitiated afterwards. Actually, Brockman and Bergson wrote a very, a very good book and a very interesting book also. It's uh, called the, the Spider and the Starfish. Actually, it has a very interesting layout with a lot of uh, using a lot of white uh, space to comfort your eyes. And by the same time, it's very, very smart in making you reading it because it, the content is distributed on its pages just the uh, in the same manner you know, that, uh, let's, say, let's say, you would uh, find chips when you want to eat. That means there are little bits of contents that, gives, that give you enough dopamine to make you feel good, but not saturated, so you're gonna just read another page, another page, and another page, because you'll never get tired. Okay, they, I, in my opinion, they have the best uh, description of a decentralized uh, organization. Who, first, who is our lead, of course, any organ or organized uh, community would have formal and informal leaders, and they have 
power, power of decision and power uh, to and power to impose. Of course, when we talk when we talk about decentralized communities, there are no one in the, to lead us. Then a, a, the problem of responsibility appears. And if we have leaders, they are responsible. But if we, we don't have leaders, then each of us is respons becomes responsible for his own action. Responsibility is a great issue. And again, it's a great issue because we are not accustomed to think that individuals are responsible. We think that we respect some laws because uh, they are enforced by police and uh, we have to pay bills if we don't respect them. But not, but a few of us just uh, think that I'm not passing on red rights because I believe that this would, uh, would put, oh, would put my life in danger and the others uh, also. So my own responsibility is not actually considered when we're talking about about uh, respect uh, res about respect some uh, regulations. Okay, being a member of a decentralized community, it's also very different because I'm not gonna get into a school, for example, if I'm not gonna receive some benefits from there. I'm not going to uh, work uh, for, I don't know, a corporation or a private uh, enterprise if I'm not going to be paid or I'm not going to have some special benefits. Maybe it's the prestige, maybe it's a material uh, benefit, maybe it's social capital, but I need to have a benefit if I'm going to be part of an organized uh, community, organized company. If by contrary, I want to be a member of a decentralized organization, then I'm there just because I share a certain ideology. I want to maximize my personal purpose. And actually, many, many uh, studies show that human beings become more and more, more like uh, pers uh, personal purpose maximizers, and they are uh, doing less for uh, attaining a social and material status, but just uh, to feel significant in the world. But of course, many of them get, become members because they want to contribute to something bigger than themselves and to something that, that would be easily shared by everyone. And here, about membership consistency, this is uh, probably the hotspot because this is why many, many protests were not well defined, not well understood. We are accustomed to define the efficiency of uh, a movement by, the, by uh, its membership consistency. If it's stable, if it's controllable, if it's measurable, if it's not going to vanish, then we can uh, we'll put our trust in that organization that is going to help us reach our, uh, our aims. But in the decentralized community, actually, membership is variable, contextual determined, and difficult to measure. And that's why they were considered inefficient. And of course, the economical structure is really different because uh, there is no, if there is a uh, material, uh, shared uh, material, material capital, then that would uh, affect uh, relationships, horizontal relationships. And that would not uh, that would bring a higher degree of organization. So, in the decentralized communities, there is no capital, no material capital. It's ve it's very interesting because if you want to kill, for example, an organization, then you have to act different when you're the confronting an uh, organized one or a, dis a decentralized one. When the United States, for example, uh, tried uh, to annihilate Al-Qaeda, it was very difficult for them because they thought they had an uh, organized community to deal with. So they had a lot uh, of misplaced uh, strategies. 
how to kill a decentralized organization when right? it's enough to create a leader uh, or to uh, give it uh, a symbolic capital. That would end horizontally of relationships and uh, that uh, would uh, bring someone that would be corrupted, that would be annihilated, that would be just uh, exited from the stream. So if you want to kill a uh, decentralized organization, you're not going to look after leaders. You're not uh, going to try to bring failure to their uh, capital. You don't look for, uh, I don't know, for food to, or su other supplies to, uh, uh, to end them. So hoping that they are going to starve after that and they, have, uh, they will uh, sur uh, surrender. It's just by the opposite, you have to give them either financial capital or a symbolic capital and then they're going to be as organized as you are and you're going to start to face them as you, in a, a custom manner. And there are very different, this kind of community, these two kinds of community are very, are very different when they are affected by crisis. Of course, decentralized, those who are decentralized are getting more decentralized and they bring a new, new, spec new spectrum of activity into their uh, uh, everyday, everyday actions and they, have, they, are, they get diversified and actually there, are, there is an increasement in activity, creativity and spontaneity in all, with every crisis occasion. It would, uh, this would uh, almost make us feel that crisis it's a, like a holiday, like a really um, a good moment to, to improve for decentralized uh, communities. And of course I don't have to talk uh, more about uh, how things are inside of uh, organized communities or hierarchical communities. Well, the main, of course, you could, many, uh, many of us asked, okay, if you don't have leaders, what do you have? It's actually a new uh, movement where you don't uh, have your individuality. You enforce that what's, how, how do you, how do you try to uh, organize and influence uh, your members? Well, a catalyst generally attracts from him, that's the main point, what the leader attracts towards him and the catalyst attracts from him. That means that, that he just uh, doesn't push his uh, value system on others and uh, he he would enforce the authentic spirit of the others. Well, he is generally an introvert, while the leader is generally an extrovert. And even though this again could uh, sound very, very utopic, actually most of us are probably familiar with transformational leadership and it's a new way now in research and practice also to pass over the classical kind of leadership that gives power to certain people and uh, we expect them to have uh, ability to control because an ability to create synergy is more sustainable on the long run. So the rise of Don Quixote as a common as a common man, it's basically the result of this decentralized community of uh, the spread the spreadness of decentralized communities, shared economies. Just to, to focus on them, they are they are considered they are considered a environment of primitive societies because we know about gift giving only among tribes but actually on primitive societies giving, gift giving is associated with 
inevitable and with uh, reciprocity, which we don't have in nowadays share, sharing uh, uh, society, sharing communities. And this would uh, make a very big uh, difference because, as I told you from, at the beginning, when I don't need to make an act because uh, I wait for uh, gratification, then my way to act and to be in the world changes a lot. So, ju just, to, ju just to remind you about what egotistic mo uh, motive means and how does it uh, function and the uh, empathetic motive, these are the the classical motive uh, that we use to explain uh, this uh, sharing uh, behavior. Uh, well, everything starts actually with a very nice theory. It's called terror magic, terror management theory. It's presupposed that we all act to diminish our negative feelings of distress when I am confronted with a situation that triggers our mortality silence. Salience. That means uh, that we need to enforce our self-esteem and to validate our worldview and to strengthen our social relationships each time we feel anxiety. Because anxiety is actually a form of our the fear of death. So the more, the, uh, the more we feel anxiety, the more we need to enhance our self-esteem. That's why the some uh, radical movements uh, were explained as uh, highly disaffected uh, communities of sufferers, of uh, people who brought a lot uh, of uh, a lot of suffering in uh, their in their uh, in their life, and now it, their uh, violent manifestation is kind of a revenge. Well, heightening our self-esteem. It's, uh, it can be made by several, uh, on, several, on a several uh, base, uh, on a varied basis. We can be egotistic and then we can uh, heighten our, uh, our self-esteem by uh, gaining uh, cap image capital and uh, then I will be altruist because I want to show others how good I am and uh, I'm going to wait uh, for them to give me recognition. I can heighten my self-esteem using a communitarian motive because when I see someone who, who reminds me of myself and he's in trouble, then I like to help him just to feel uh, more uh, comforted, more assured that probably if I would be in that situation again, someone would help me, and that's how I would gain more trust in the world. However, if I work, if uh, I actually action, my action are, is based on the quixotic motive, then I don't have this reciprocity. I'm not waiting for gratification. My self-esteem is not dependent of uh, something. Uh, very well defined. Actually, I'm working with a very broad uh, worldview and a very broad frame. I feel good just because the world probably got a little bit better. If I don't do this nice thing, then the, uh, the world would be uh, j just not that uh, not that uh, a nice place anymore. It doesn't. It's something that's very important here is to make the distinction <coughs> that quixotic actions are not dependent of their uh, uh, grandeur. I don't have uh, to make a big, uh, a big altruist uh, act to feel that uh, my action is significant for bettering the world. Just most. Uh, of the people, for example, who share this uh, quixotic motive of action, just uh, feel uh, great when uh, they are able to show, I don't know, the, the sun or uh, to others because they made them happy and make happier single person would mean better in the whole 
the world also. So it's not uh, about uh, how how big our difference is, it's just about the nature of our act. Okay, F first of all, I, I probably passed over that slide. First of all, I was looking if, uh, I was interested if uh, this quixotic motive of course really exists. And some researchers said that he he really is exists and he is, there is a tendency more and more of us are starting to act on its basis. These are the most correlated features with quixotic action. So person who has uh, person who have daring attitude towards life, they are probably the most uh, acting on a quixotic motive. They are courageous and they are seeking adventures. It's ve it's very interesting because if you if you see uh, the sensitivity towards social justice is just the second feature associated with this utopic uh, utopian uh, motive. But looking all the, on the uh, on the rest of this set, we see curiosity, communion with nature preference for exciting life and diversity, violation of freedom, for spirituality, variation of beauty, and it has creativity. So all these are features that are not associated with uh, passive people, are not associated uh, with uh, necessarily with uh, dreamers who don't uh, get out from, uh, from their comfort zone. Actually, exotic motive is associated with the most active uh, persons. Its, it's impact is because this is what we are interested in, of course. Why would we seek for people who act on this motive and why motives would matter after all? Well, those who act on exotic motive are more involved in their causes. When someone, when uh, someone is uh, trying to help another person or is uh, or get involved in a cause, is gonna be there for a long time and is gonna spend a lot of resources. Not like those who act on egotistic motives or communitarian motives. Those uh, will gonna, those are gonna get uh, are gonna get involved very easily, but they are not gonna be there for long actually. Okay, just uh, I was curious if uh, this uh, exotic motive uh, would uh, is really uh, gaining centrality in a, uh, among uh, sh uh, sharing communities. So I looked at Impossible and Couchsurfing, and you probably are familiar with both of them. And uh, I not gonna bore you with technical details about the method I used. The idea is that impossible it's uh, structured as a very decentralized uh, lecture uh, that enables people to give for free and to post requests about what they would like to receive for free. And there are no groups because uh, its initiators didn't want to, to make it like a community, but more like a widespread network, enabling a lot of uh, a lot of people to do good, not because they recognize in that profile, but because uh, they are given the chance to help someone and to uh, contribute to a better world. Couchsurfing, of course, is not the same. It's probably it, it was uh, structured from its first, its first beginning as a commu community, a community of travel lovers who could uh, help each other to uh, stay for free in different uh, locations. But groups across this platform are, de are decentralized and are spontaneous uh, created. And inside these groups, people started uh, a lot uh, of uh, projects but they are also able to post requests and post uh, offers uh, by which they could uh, enhance their own plans or enhance actually their self-esteem. 
So what do impossible and power surfing have in common? I, I, what I was interested in was the ability of users to to have direct actions, to direct communicate and to, to organize themselves without uh, someone to moderate them. And of course they share this. And the communication is also, as I said, it's direct. But they are not the same because impossible is framed more for the uh, as more conducive for exotic reasoning, while couchsurfing is the design as more conducive to communitarian, communitarian thinking. Of course, after I measured all these uh, all these tendencies, the results were uh, uh, to the the beginning quite amazing, amazing and uh, disturbing, because yeah, the exotic motive had a tendency to grow starting with the first quarter of 2014 on both sides, but actually impossible, which was designed for exotic action, was not, was not, was not to, in any how represented by its users, because users actually were, uh, uh, were higher in request, in material request, so they were more focused on what on uh, egotistic uh, kind of actions and uh, communitarian kind of actions. While on couchsurfing, which was designed designed as a community from the beginning, well, the exotic motive uh, scored uh, much higher, and then. Of course, we had to we had to explain that why is this contrast uh, between uh, the core ideology displayed on uh, blogs because there's uh, that's the lobby uh, uh, the lobby house to say it like that and uh, the behavior of uh, their members and here. To explain, to explain that, we have to take uh, into consideration how passion works. But before that, we should uh, think, uh, we should uh, stand a little bit more on why is it actually important if people act on exotic uh, motives or, or not. Okay, there is a tendency, so what? The banality of evil and the banality of heroism it's another concept, not necessarily a new one, because after uh, the Second World War, everybody talks about how each of us can become a torturer and every, each of us can uh, uh, be a hero. There are many, there are many experiments about uh, this, showing that uh, for being a torturer. You don't have uh, to have any pathology, you're just a normal person, but put it in certain uh, situation, you have a uh, behavior that <coughs> you would never think you're capable of. And this is, the, uh, the things are working the same with heroes. Well, what does it take to do the, the evil, because this, the context is important? It's enough to assume that you have no responsibility for your actions. It's enough uh, to say it's okay to sacrifice a little bit of our of your current freedoms for a better future. But actually, this is the speech that every government in the history used when they were planning to abuse society in a, a certain way. They said, "Okay, you have to make a sacrifice now, but this is for a bright future." There are no bright futures actually that are based on this kind of abuses because of this is another topic but this brings a lot of uh, parasite noise to say like that a lot of problems that uh, get very complicated during time so there is not a better future when abuses are at places of course, being obedient actually is the most correlated attitude with becoming a torturer.
What does it do to be a hero? Well, perceive error as natural. Saying, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do it anymore and so on, and be mindful and being responsible for your actions and believe that you're good enough because if you don't believe you're good enough, you're going to try to compensate your lack of self-esteem and that would bring again abuses towards others. Don't be obedient, of course, towards authorities and don't feel anonymity, don't feel insignificant and don't let others feel like that. And don't, yes, it's important, Zimbardo say it's important to be careful and display symbols because they are framing our, our uh, mental uh, space and then we're going to accept more easily their ideological background. So being a hero, that means to be a Don Quixote in everyday life, in your everyday life. No, actually being a hero, it's related with the, descent, with the ideal type of decentralized organization. Because there each member is supposed to be responsible, it's, it's supposed to be conscious, it's supposed to have complete freedom and complete uh, responsibility for his actions. But Don Quixote is, let's say, champions of sharing and altruism are created among these decentralized network, networks. And we didn't ask, we didn't answer to a very important question. They, uh, they say decentralized organizations are not, uh, are not uh, useful, are not uh, functioning, if you remember, because of their unstable membership, because they don't last long. Well, actually, when we talk about uh, exotic uh, reasoning and actions based on exotic reasoning, we saw that people tend to be very stable, very much engaged, and very much uh, open to spend a lot of their resources for, for a cause they believe in. So this, is, this could mean uh, a change that would occur across uh, this efficiency of decentralized, uh, decentralized manifestation. It's not actually unfunctioning, it's not actually uh, easily uh, vanished just because its membership it's, uh, is uh, so much unstable because people continue to care about certain cases. They are they are improving themselves and they try to improve others by, keep, by this kind of uh, attitude. So they would be actually more efficient on the, uh, in uh, their relationship with the world and, with the ch and in their uh, act actions to change the world more efficient than the others. Being decentralized doesn't mean to vanish away if you have a, a exotic core. And now, as <coughs> I said, we, it's very interesting how exotic tendency formed among a, com a community that was designed from the beginning to enhance communitarian actions and not exotic actions. And most, the most probable, the, there is a new variable that could moderate the spread the appearance of exotism and that is passion. And of course, passion is related to, with the flux and the self transcendent knowledge. And you all know what flux means, is that the, it's that state when you're totally immersed in what you're doing, that's why it's correlated with passion. And actually, this could be the most important information we've got from uh, analyzing the type of the exotic, uh, the exotic uh, subtype of uh, decentralized communities. Because, you know, when you feel the flux, then you're there, then you don't uh, 
you don't, uh, you're not looking for uh, exit. And during the protest, the ability to fear the flux cha uh, changed the, the story a lot because before the, uh, the flux was uh, constructed, was uh, enabled, people were, uh, uh, people felt uh, fear, angry, uh, Ne a lot of negative emotions and they got uh, disengaged from uh, protesting but when the flux was created then they felt they are part of something bigger and there is no coming back. So flux is very very important in, uh, uh, to keep a movement in motion and the most probably is that a lot of decentralized communities are so much uh, unstable because people are not uh, receiving enough opportunities to experience flux, to experience passion. Exotic reasoning, it's not enough. Exotic reasoning and opportunities to feel really connected and to feel uh, to feel the flux, it's actually a, bet, a better recipe if, you, if we would want to rise a new movement and to change the world in a, let's say, in a, in a more obvious way. Alright, that's all. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, hello. Uh, I know the great expectations from the yesterday's presentation, as my colleague did. And I also, you are, uh, some of you are curious about what I'm going to tell today, but please do not, uh, sorry? No, 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 okay. So, uh, I will take your time. Uh, I will pass the academic and technical details. I just want to, focus on the details I found during my uh, research because the leads are the most important part of this research. And by the way, please do not forget that this is a preliminary research and the beginning of another big research also conducted with the yesterdays. So, let's start. You know, uh, the last year there was an important and great uprising held on Taksim Square, as named on the net Gezi protest. Uh, I prefer to say Gezi uprising or resistance. Just want to give some small statistics about uh, Turkey's internet and computer usage. So. As you see on the screen, on the left side, uh, computer usage, and on the right side, uh, internet usage of uh, Turkish population by age. So, we can easily say that both computer and uh, internet technologies are uh, used by young uh, population most. Can you see the numbers? Yes. Sorry not to change that, but uh, as you can see, uh, both gender and usage are close. Uh, we have about 35 million internet users in Turkey, and it's about 45% of all population. And let me say something at this point. Uh, Turkey's population uh, average is 28. And if I'm not wrong, uh, we are the youngest country in Europe. So uh, we plan to focus on youth because uh, also the Gezi protest uh, was uh, first started by the youth. So, about five hours a day, they use 
personal computers and 1.9 uh, hours mobile. And average daily social media time spending is 2 hours 32 mi uh, minutes. And the social media platform used in Turkey, as you see, Facebook is first, then Twitter, Google Plus, and LinkedIn. Uh, as I told you, I'm not going to give detailed information about uh, this part. You can see and you can read in proceeding. I choose focus group method. That's the qualitative research uh, method which you choose participants uh, then ask them non-structured questions and try to understand how do they understand, how do they believe, uh, how do they perceive something. So I have chosen five men, five women, all <clears throat> bachelor's students between 19 to 25 age. And the most important part. In one hour session of interview with 10 uh, students, uh, I came across these themes. First one is fear. I asked them what do they understand from activism? What is activism and what is virtual activism? Then, if they involved any activism uh, in real life or in a virtual platform. So, with these questions, I get these data. Fear. Sorry. Uh, fear has two faces. For them. First of all, you know, during the Gezi protests, uh, nine people were killed by police, thousands injured, hundreds lost their eyes or some other organs. Uh, and during that process, for the civil uprisers, Twitter was the most important and primary communication tool. People communicated mostly via Twitter and the other also of course they used uh, then you know there had been a conflict between the government and the Twitter and the Twitter banned in Turkey uh, also YouTube and some other platforms uh, were banned and uh, as I know from my own uh, knowledge Global Plus also used heavily to upload photos, videos, or uh, something else. They first fear to be bitten by police, but there is some other important uh, point that they also fear from social isolation. Uh, let me give an example. One of the students said that, uh, by the way, she is living in a small village and the village has a Facebook group. In Eskişehir, during that process, a 19-year-old student of my university was killed uh, by kicking heads with civilians and police, and the people protested that. And she had written something on Facebook about this process, and she was threatened uh, to burn his house or to be raped or uh, killed family members. So, uh, they see as uh, they see social media as a virtual platform, and they do not believe that they can change something. And also, uh, they do not trust social media. Trust also has some other uh, points. For example, they both believe uh, friendships via Facebook, Twitter, or somewhere else is temporary. And also, the groups are temporary. When I asked them if they uh, involved any activists 
activism uh, from the net, they said that uh, you just click on something, but you do nothing in real life. But when I asked them, did you do? Yes. Why did you do that? It's a personal masturbation, just uh, as they see. I asked their uh, political point of view. None of the 10 attenders uh, belong to any political parties. Uh, and they define, describe themselves as a political person, but they are proud of it to be a political. <coughs> so, also, uh, for my opinion, uh, I think because of their history, uh, they don't have a history, political history, because 10 of them said that uh, the Gezi protest was uh, their first protest. The first time uh, they were in the streets, before the Gezi, uh, they are not engaged on politics. As I told you, temporality, uh, this makes them feel some alien uh, on the net, they said, uh, because everything is temporary and nothing is certain on the net. So that they don't believe activism on the uh, internet. And I, as I told you, uh, virtual real, uh, for example, they say that the groups on the net are restrictive. For example, a literature group, you can only discuss literature. And I ask them that aren't any groups that you can uh, talk everything or discuss everything? Yes, maybe you can, but it just only depends on the rulers or moderator of the groups. So uh, they do not choose to be activists on the net. And the last point, masturbation, as I told you uh, before, I asked them that uh, if you have ability to hack somewhere like Ratek or Anonymous, does this mean a real, uh, for example, you hacked all the government uh, sites? Does this mean a real activism on the net? Yes, they said. And so, uh, why the others are not? Uh, that is interesting, you know, Ice Bucket Challenge is popular nowadays. They say that uh, the project or the trend uh, get in front of the uh, illness. So, uh, and there is important point, Turkey is one of the most people who attended Ice Bucket Challenge, but uh, who gave the lowest money. So that I think uh, they are through for saying that this is a virtual masturbation. So uh, as I told you before, my main purpose was how to perceive activism, how to define, how do that define it, and uh, how to understand the Virtual activism, activism on the net. As I told you, this is my uh, opinion from the interview I got. Uh, our country has a real education problem because in a quantity we may be seen a, an educated country, but in quantity the education level is really low and much of the people just got their political views from their family or uh, just mainstream gossips. They have beliefs, but they do not have words to describe them. This is the end. I thank you. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask. And these are my connections. You can add me whatever, whenever you want. Thank you.
got two questions for you. Um, you said Twitter was blocked. Uh, in this time, a lot of uh, movements in Europe, uh, also some pirate parties, opened proxies. Uh, was the knowledge of this happening um, widespread within Turkey? Did people know that they could use proxies uh, from uh, European partners to access Twitter and other platforms? Sorry? Uh, when, when Twitter was blocked? Yes, uh, we used proxies. Yeah, so and Tunnel Beer, you know, gave free uh, membership. Yeah, so this knowledge was uh, was widespread. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, the second question, uh, I believe that the, the lack of trust in the social networks is actually okay because you, you should not trust them yeah, that much. I also uh, have some quick curiosity about this. Uh, is there, uh, do people that would like to voice their opinion but can't because of these fears, uh, have they, do they have knowledge of uh, methods to hide their identity? No, they do not. Actually, uh, I asked them, do you have fake profiles or uh, what do you do to uh, become anonymous on the net? We don't become anonymous, they say. Uh, there is one point when they become anonymous, uh, that's when flirting. <laughs> and others? If you don't have, uh, let's say thank you to Halil and to Fook for this presentation. Well, now, well, question. Sorry. Well, do you have a question? Yeah. Really? Is it okay? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Can I use this? Can I ask them? Can I use this one? Yes, of course. Okay. Uh, I just wonder, it, it happens that one of the initiators to the Gezi uh, protests uh, now happens to be uh, in Norway because they got harassed. Um, but uh, this started with approximately 200 people uh, at Toxin, uh, didn't it? And it was uh, posted as an event on Facebook. Yes. And that's how it all started. Yes. Uh, for example, in my research, I add that if you ever involved any uh, street protests from the internet, they said yes. And how did you trust them? We, we don't uh, have to trust them because we were thousands, we were like an army. So what happened and this uh, become to an end? People leave to home. And this uh, conjects with another point uh, that they say, because uh, when I ask them that, if you have chance to change everything in Turkey, uh, where will you start? Uh, first, uh, I found a great leader, and I follow him.
like a cultural activity for them. But it become serious in Turkey. Yes. Uh, the power, the people who have power really feared about, really feared from them. They get scared, really. For the first time. They were they were untouchable. They but they touched. Uh, maybe you heard the story of uh, a, f a group of fan of a, a football team, Beşiktaş. What was the name? Çarşı. Group of Çarşı. Uh, they were very active at, at, the, at those times. And uh, they conflicted with police. And even they got one of their cars from them and announced from uh, from that car to the other people, the protesters. So uh, I don't blame on uh, young people to uh, to, uh, to be feared, uh, and they they are apolitic, but they don't trust institutional politics. So they their understanding of politics is different, I believe. So. Institutional politics has to change its nature, I believe. And I want to share some data about uh, these protests on Twitter. Uh, we have recorded lots of data on uh, first day, second day, and third day of these protests and all of the mount. Uh, as a summary, uh, before the Gezi protests, uh, there were one million people uh, the, on Twitter users were tweeting in Twitter, uh, Turkish, Turkey, uh, Turkish Twitter. But after the Gezi protests, in, in two days, it increased uh, to two million and five hundred thousand people. This is a very big, big increase, and we cannot say uh, they don't uh, trust the. Uh, social media. They trust to networks, their networks, because this was a, uh, this was the only uh, mass communication uh, media for the people. Because all of the national news channels has censored all news about uh, these protests. But after uh, the pressure of uh, Twitter on. Uh, uh, on com MS communication, the uh, national TV channels and uh, newspapers had to give the all news about uh, Gezi protest. After that, the government started to uh, make uh, new communication ways on uh, mass media. And uh, when we look after that, after the Gezi protest, we uh, recorded lots of uh, protests uh, in one year. Uh, and uh, these are another subject, but uh, Twitter was the uh, main actors uh, in this protest. Well, was one of the main actors in this protest. Okay, thank you. And, okay, now we are having the last speaker, which is very exciting. Uh, you are from Israeli pilot party, and his speech is about Occupy Wi-Fi.
of their leaders and their board. And as you can see, our logo contains both Hebrew and both Arabic, which are uh, formal uh, languages in Israel, and English, which is the unofficial language of the internet. So this is, these are some pictures from the Israeli protest movement. Uh, we formed as a group around this uh, protest, uh, the Israeli version of the Occupy movement, which was a part of the social protest and pro-democracy protests all around the world in 2011. And this may be the uh, constitutive uh, political movement of my generation in Israel, and it certainly uh, constituted the Israeli uh, Israeli right party. And for me, um, these quarters were a lot about private issue, issues and agendas, transparency in budgets, more participatory political system, protest against monopolies, justice in courts, etc. Uh, this is called the tense protest because people uh, live in tents in the center of Tel Aviv in Rothschild Boulevard, which is quite symbolic name in that essence. And they lived in tents because the rent was too high. And so, uh, uh, yeah, um, it was a really progressive public sphere in that uh, uh, time. It was kind of like Abermas vision or kind of like I'd mind. Uh, the occupiers had councils to decide uh, about the agenda and uh, the class of actions. Uh, the tents, the, their architecture and what they symbolized uh, and how they let people communicate freely uh, in an open environment uh, were a lot like uh, what's going on in the web or in the x web uh, in the middle of the summer. Uh, it was a platform for a different political and economic system. Uh, in my eyes, it was a lot like uh, what is going on in, in the book, Bolo Bolo, if anyone read it. It was uh, an experiment. Uh, yeah, this is uh, the slogan for the protest, uh, which is uh, the people demand social justice. Of course, Toki had uh, this version uh, of the Occupy movement also. Uh, we talked about uh, earlier uh, the Taksim and Gezi part. And this is taken from our Facebook page, which we sought uh, to show solidarity with the Turkish protesters. And uh, this is in Turkish, and this is the translation in English. I hope that's correct. And we approach them as chapulers. Anyone who is not Turkish here doesn't know the meaning of the word chocolates. This is how the president uh, called the protesters, and in Turkish it means uh, looters, vandal, or pounds. And much like the digital, digital virus, and this is a quote from Kipperia, the protesters quickly decided, decided to reappropriate the term and began to describe themselves as chocolates. Uh, within days, they usually negative term was being used as a positive term of, of self-identification. International supporters of Gezi Park events posted social media photos of themselves, holding messages, I am a chocolate as well. And I'm telling this story because in Israel and Turkey and Iceland and other places, um, the battle is not just for file sharing or for copyright reform. It's, this is maybe the metaphor for freedom of, of information and better use of technology in the information age. But it's a part of a bigger battle for democracy and for a social reform, a battle for transparency, for not being watched, for a participatory system, a better economic and monetary system, etc. The board of, of politics is being rewritten uh, at the moment, and the uh, pirates, uh, the, for our uh, ideology or post ideology, uh, should play a major part in this weather. Um, as we say here, free internet, free public sphere. Uh, there is a connection between free internet and free progressive public sphere. This is the essence of information age politics. Uh, yeah. So, our territory, both 
online and offline, or maybe if you will, um, the internet or the web is the map of the territory which is uh, the X-Web or the streets. Uh, so our territory is in danger of being taken from us. The NSA, the Battle for Net Neutrality, the arrest of Pirate Bay founders and some unknowns, initiatives like SOPA or ACTA and many domestic wars which threaten the freedom of the internet. Um, but not also the freedom to voice of opinion in the internet, also the freedom to voice of opinion in the streets. These are the pictures from uh, the one year anniversary of the uh, social movement in Israel. And then the police got really active and didn't let uh, protesters to uh, protest free, and there were rules against it. Like I said, everyone lived in tents. But one year after that, if you wanted to put a tent on the street, uh, the police would come and uh, arrest you. So this is why they uh, marched with the tents in their hands, because they couldn't uh, put it on the ground. Um, the vehicle here is called the raccoon. Uh, it's a military vehicle usually, uh, but it uh, uses to collect uh, signal, signal intelligence and it was uh, placed in the middle of Tel Aviv, collecting the uh, digital uh, data for the protesters. And the woman uh, on the picture in the right above is actually the leader of the protest movement in 2011, which was brutally arrested uh, one year uh, after that. Um, So, we thought as a part, if you can't protest in the streets, uh, what else can we do in order to help protesters so they can protest? Uh, what is the elegant, the technology-based pirate solution? The answer is Occupy Wi-Fi. Occupy Wi-Fi, uh, this is taken from the website of the project, is a public performance piece, wireless art, wireless art installation, and activism tool for the posts of the era all at once. It takes advantage of the most basic human need, the constant angle for open Wi-Fi networks in public spaces. Um, the concept is very simple. It's uh, to uh, uh, turn yourself into a web server or a propaganda distributor via a portable router or not portable router. Uh, corporations do that already every time you try to log in to a network on by McDonald's for, for a bank, you get um, a, a commercial for their uh, services. So why not use this idea in order to uh, send propaganda? Um, some of the origins of the projects are in this uh, slide. Uh, I don't know if you know, uh, Adam Bartol is a German artist, and this is his project called uh, Dedo. Uh, in, in this project, it is very simple. He plugged a Dedo in the street, and anyone there can share files or can uh, upload and download files, or maybe even uh, uh, matters of national security. Uh, and they can do it anonymously. It's an uh, offline network. It's the concept of the internet, only offline. Um, and this is called the Firefox, which is uh, uh, one step further. It is USB, only USB with a router. So you don't have to physically uh, connect your computer to the world. You can sit around a few hundred meters uh, in the radius and still upload and download information uh, without uh, the NSA, for example, can monitor it. So, uh, why occupy Wi-Fi? Why, what are the advantages of this project? And we are giving the crowd's attention. Everybody is looking for a network, and when, when they find an open network, because if you walk in the streets and uh, to the in Turkey, for example, my phone only works with Wi-Fi, and I try to find uh, open networks. And there aren't any. Uh, if there are, they are rare. And when I finally find one, if I get a message, I might read it. Uh, anonymity is permanent. It's legal until they make it illegal. Uh, you can demonstrate when you are not allowed. This is kind of, uh, 
sort of hacking because uh, if there is a place I can demos demonstrate in, but I can still uh, place a router uh, near it, and people there can still uh, read my propaganda. It's, you don't sweat, you don't have to uh, be a real activist with all the connotations. It's, you can sit at your cafe and they let people uh, know what you think about banks. And uh, no communication breakdown, this is for protests because in protests uh, the communication networks fail uh, sometimes uh, because of the overload. Uh, in this way, you, you can still uh, post your messages. Yeah, so this is um, our first mission uh, that was against the biometric database. Uh, which is a unique database that uh, only Israel has. Uh, the bio biometric database, um, some of you may have a smart ID, I guess they call it. It's a G digital ID which you, you can be recognized by your fingerprint, and then you get uh, services from the government, unlike the thumb ID, which is only paper, and uh, people can vote. It. So Israel wanted to have smart ID like in many other uh, European countries. But uh, they had another uh, addition to that, which is the database. In order to have a smart ID, you don't have to have a database which collects all your personal uh, uh, data, which is uh, the fingerprint and the social recognition uh, biometric data. Um, but in Israel, which is sometimes referred as the lab, because we make experiments in technology against the Palestinians, with military technology, but this experiment is being made about uh, Israeli citizens. And this database really was all day of uh, lecturing, but the basic concept of it is that every citizen is a suspect to begin with, because uh, you collect a fingerprint for someone only if he's a suspect. But now uh, they want uh, to make it mandatory uh, for all uh, the Israelis to give their government by law uh, their fingerprints. Uh, we managed to make the rule not mandatory in the field stage, but on, only pilot, uh, which is not really pilot because uh, there is no criteria, for example, of how it will fail or how it will succeed. They, they just do it as a pilot uh, to say they are doing pilot and maybe uh, then make him mandatory. So you see why we as pirates are opposed, uh, opposing uh, this biometric database, which is also a threat for national security if there is a leak of this database. Uh, in, this is a big struggle for us in Israel. Um, so we wanted to protest against it. It was natural for us to protest against it. But the only problem we can protest against it in the interior office itself, because we can't protest in the, in the office of the government. And even the interior office is where they issue the, the, the smart ideas and when the uh, people would uh, go and they try to renew their idea, they tell them they want to join this uh, pilot and most people who have no awareness and want to have a smart idea and to connect with their government through this idea online and uh, make payments quicker, join it. Maybe old people who are not aware of the dangers of this uh, database and what the political meaning of it. So uh, we can protest against it unless we go with the router, which isn't really a uh, protest because they don't know who is, it, uh, who is using this. Uh, if we went at uh, any flywheel, they would flag us and they take us out. Um, and in, in the interior offices, there is propaganda from the government uh, via TVs. So the only way uh, we, can, we can propaganda against it is using the new media against the old media. So we went in there with these uh, portable routers and we had a message against it uh, uh, on them, but uh, we didn't let it by chance so people would connect to that network. We, uh, and then this little notes and the symbol here is the symbol of the Ministry of Interior and so told them it's from the Ministry of Interior. They told them that if 
they want to get a, a new ID quicker, then they should connect to the network that uh, was on the router. And uh, it doesn't they have to uh, press uh, with their uh, finger on it. Of course, it doesn't take your fingerprint, but it takes it to the next screen. And in the next screen, uh, there is a question, are you mad? Why do you want to join the, this, uh, this uh, pilot of the biometric database? And then it tells you why it's wrong and why you shouldn't do it. Um, Another aspect of the project is uh, the name of the Wi-Fi. Uh, they changed the name of the Wi-Fi network and use it also as a propaganda tool uh, to spray a message, uh, uh, the message you want to convey, um, which, because there is no law that regulates it. You can go into a bank and uh, call yourself uh, your network name in the name of the bank and you will think you are the bank and try to connect you. Uh, it's just like a putting your name in the Google Ads of your competitor. Um, I open up with a broader look about the danger of freedom of information both in cyberspace and both industries. The map and the territory. Um, our digital protest project Occupy Wi-Fi is not only a tool for, for protesters to bypass some of the restrictions against them in the streets, but, but also a concept and a symbol for our battle for democracy and freedom of information, which is an you know, online demonstration in the offline. And the web, as we know it, might not be free, but one of the questions we raised through this project is what is the web? there is one internet. And this is a quote from an article in the Atlantic. Uh, uh, what Gordon M. Gosson uh, talks about the end of the internet. The end of the internet, in that sense, uh, many rules or many regulations uh, constitute many internets. And he talks about in the state level, uh, the Brazilian internet or the Turkish internet or the United States internet, but you can add to that uh, Google internet or Facebook internet, especially if they have the, inf the infrastructure. Um, so this is the question in the top card. Um, and the awareness we try to bring in that project is that there is no one internet, there are many internets because much like the deadlock, which is in the concept of the internet only in the streets. And this project is a, a network which is separate from the internet, but if they were uh, connected to other routers, much like a mesh network, there would be another internet. Uh, so this may be uh, talking about the solution for the privatized uh, and monitored internet, uh, many local internets. The internet nation may be a federal state, like in the world before for many norm. And if that is the case, we need to occupy our own networks, be the global net of autonomous mesh networks and alternative infrastructures that will be net neutral and new independent platform. And so this is the message of Occupy Wi-Fi. This is the call. We should occupy our own network, maybe. And that's it. And we plan to use that practice also uh, for a homeless camp uh, in Tel Aviv and build them their own uh, mesh network so they could talk or they could protest. Um, and I think this is one of the main questions we have to ask ourselves in the next few years uh, about what is the internet and what we do not just uh, regulation-wise but infrastructure-wise. That's it. Is there any questions to you? 
Okay, next presentation is by me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, you need to read a little more. Well, this is the end, unfortunately. Uh, First of all, I would like to really thank you for Julia, Birgitta, and the other speaker, speakers, Mari, Ufuk, Oana, Joao, uh, Yosef. Yosef, Rico, everybody, and some other guys. Who is? Ah, I already mentioned. Halil? Where is Halil? Okay. And <clears throat> some other people who are really helpful for us, like Tala, Ula, I think, Ule, and Kun. Thank for the ISSN. Oh, by the way, with the ISSN, I need your full papers until September 15. We are going to publish proceeding book, and it will be it will be sent to 500 universities and some European parliaments. So please send your full papers, we need that. <coughs> it will be published both electronically and printed version. Uh, and, oh, we are going to have a dinner. And thanks for this great conference and you need to come here and cheer yourself, please. Thank you. Please come here. On the stage and we will have a photos. Photos, then we can go to the dinner wedding. <laughs> come here. Fotoğraf makinen yanında mı? Çekebilir misin bizi? I forgot Anders, I'm so sorry, the miracle guy. <laughs> you forgot how come? Oh, I'm so sorry. My research assistant and my friend Hakan also uh, is a great guy. He showed his great effort for for this conference. Yeah, 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 yeah I know. <laughs> so, Bülent Bey, seni de buraya alalım. Arkadaki arkadaş gelmek isterse onu da alalım. Bir toplu fotoğrafla bu işi bitirelim. Where is Masha? Masha is missing. Masha! That's the spray. Come here. Sizi de bekliyorduk ama. <gülüyor> gel gel bekliyoruz bekliyoruz. We are waiting for you. Come here. <gülüyor> Can Hoca nerede? <gülüyor> oh, so the vice director is coming. Hocam, sizi de bekliyoruz. For for last photo with our vice director from the university. We are so thankful for the university and him.
Amen. Just 